you know, really talk a lot in the book about the importance of what we consider the lower chakras, that if we are not connected to our body, we are not having a human experience. Right. This is why we came here. However, right. you want to uh, put meaning around the spirituality of why we're here, the light that's within us, we chose these bodies to have some experience. Yeah. Along the way, we probably had some really disturbing experiences that is up to us to, to heal. But yes, when we are disconnected from our body, it's incomplete. It's bypassing. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather. And in this episode, I am joined by author, counselor, and marriage and family therapist, C.J. Llewellyn, to discuss her book, Chakras in the Vagus Nerve. Among many other topics, C.J. talks about how trauma is stored in the body, the connection between the subtle energy of the chakras and the nervous system, how we can tap into the system to affect healing, and how we connect to our souls through our bodies. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. CJ Llewellyn is a licensed professional counselor and marriage and family therapist. Her passion is combining the psychological, physical, and spiritual to heal trauma and facilitate personal and spiritual growth in her clients. CJ serves as an internal family systems therapist and is certified in EMDR processing and trained in energy psychology. She is also a Reiki master and intuitive. CJ, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you for having me, Nick. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, well, I'm happy that you're here too. We spoke a little before I hit record, and I explained that I've had some personal experiences with energy in the body and blockages, and I have heard of the vagus nerve, more mm-hmm. familiar with the chakras, but as soon as I saw your book, I thought, I want to talk to this person, so I'm really <laughs> glad that you're here and grateful for your time. Awesome. Um, so I, I do have a question for you, and the first question I have is, what is the vagus nerve? And uh, Ah. what does it do? What role does it play? So I've been answering this question a lot lately. It is the longest nerve in our body. It is part of the autonomic nervous system. Years ago, people just thought it was just sort of some extra bag of nerves. What the vagus nerve does, it is, it starts in the cranium. It is part of the 10th cranium that runs down, has three branches. Mm. The way I like to really kind of sum it up is it's our, it's our safety wiring and it connects to the brain and it's sending signals up and down the system all the time. It's, it's our, it's our wiring that just, just discerns if we're in safe situations or not. Um, It's connected to the major organs. So those times that we've been upset and our stomach goes, that's the vagus nerve sending, you know, signals down to us about whatever it believes is happening. Mm. I'm trying to, as I talk about it, take it out of the weeds, so to speak, and make it accessible so that people understand we have this wiring in our system. Because if we're not looking at it as something that comes out of a biology test, Mm. (laughs) we can see it as something that we can access, listen to, manage, so that it. I think it empowers us that way Mm. to know that our biology is very much from the neck down is very much part of our communication systems. Because as you know, you know, in our Western culture, we're only supposed to stay from the neck up. Anything that comes through mind, any of the linear thinking, any of the conclusions come from up here. We're we're missing a whole sector of our communication system down here. That is processed through the vagus nerve. Okay. And so I am curious, and I don't know if you can answer this. You don't address this in the book, but as you were speaking, it's something that came to mind is I have seen articles and read research that talks about our second brain uh, Mm -hmm. that's sort of in the gut area. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it is, where Mm -hmm. we get that feeling of, you know, there's just something in our gut, you know, that feeling. Is that connected to the vagus nerve? Is that the vagus nerve at work? It really is. It's That's a a really great way to put it. It is the vagus nerve at work Mm -hmm. because the vagus nerve is 
as it is part of the autonomic nervous system and there's different branches of it and they, some are, some work faster than others. Yeah. It's, it's the vagus nerve that is connected to the, all the digestive system, the kidneys. Mm. And yeah, you know, there's a lot of conversation going on about the health of our, our stomach, you know, serotonin is also built in, Mm. is created in the stomach as well as the brain, because we think serotonin is only in the brain. So it's all connected in that way. So yes, the answer is it's, it's very much the vagus nerve at work. Okay. I I like the way you put that. (laughs) Can I steal it? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For sure. I don't mind. (laughs) So it seems like there is a connection and a lot of your work is focused on trauma. And what role does the vagus nerve play in trauma? Because it seems like if it's there to help keep us safe, Mm -hmm. that would it be that the trauma is is the vagus nerve kind of sending out warnings when we are unsafe? Yes. And sometimes the vagus nerve will misfire along with the brain. If we have had patterns in early childhood or complex traumas, you know, repeated traumas over time that may not have been developmental, right? Mm. The wiring in our system, the brain and the central nervous system, the the vagus nerve are storing information for us. Mm. Mm again, to keep us safe. So if we've had, you know, let's say we've, we have been abused throughout childhood, there are signals of safety within the system that get misfired when we are adults. Mm. So sounds, people that registered a lack of safety when we were child, children, you know, if we were abused by, I don't know, a curly headed, redheaded man, when we meet curly headed, redheaded men, you know, as adults, our system registers that lack of safety. Mm. So it's, it's a, it's, it stores, it's a data store as well, Mm. you know, and there are three branches to it that hold on to different information and have different functions for us as well. Okay. Yeah. We, we may go into some of those three branches because I think that's the polyvagal theory, Mm -hmm. but I just wanted to comment before moving on that it is so different than how we tend to think of traumas and other sort of psychological issues that there is a physical bodily component to them Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. we store the traumas in the body. Yes. And, you know, you and I were talking off, off before we started recording here Stephen Porges, by the way, if anybody wants to really get into the weeds and the reading and the polyvagal theory, go for it. He's he's well published. He's he's there's a lot of information out there. With the polyvagal theory, he was researching heart rate variabilities, but we were start and he was starting to see that through our system, through our nervous system, we were having these sort of psychophysiological reactions. Mm. Trauma therapists along the line were saying, well, we see this all the time in our work. This is an emotion. This is a, this is a, a a bodily reaction that has applied meaning to it that people are responding to. And when you've had traumas, you may be, you are pretty much maybe over responding, right? Mm -hmm. You're over correcting when you're in situations because the, because your body is feeling unsafe. I hope that just made sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, well, it seems that I think a lot of this is because, because it's held in the body, we may not be consciously aware of mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we've been triggered in a sense, right? And that we will end up doing things and engaging in repetitive behaviors based on that. And it's literally, I mean, technically it's unconscious, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of the, the language for it. Yes. And then the meaning that is applied, is there something wrong with me? Right. right. I'm just overreactive. I'm sensitive. I don't like this. I'm hard to deal with. I can't have relationships. We start the brain and we just start interpreting these meanings is that, that there's something wrong with us. And Mm -hmm. we do develop coping strategies that sometimes are not helpful, Right. but if we can start seeing the connection between how we were treated or the experiences that we had and the information that was stored in our system, then we can start finding the right avenues of healing yeah. for it. 
Yeah. And and when I started really doing a lot of trauma work years ago in EMDR, I, I kept hearing from my trainers, clearing it out of your system. And mm. I would think, that's just crazy. How do you clear that stuff out? Aren't you supposed to just sort of walk around it, manage it for most of your life? No, it clears it out. Mm. The, a lot of the, the, the body mind modalities, particularly EMDR, and I'm finding IFS does the same thing. It's clearing out these traumas that are stored so that we have room. We have a way to be in the world now that has space to it, mm. which of course goes to the whole spirituality aspect of this, that we can right. have access to who we are, that self-energy in, in us, that, that soul, yeah. whatever, however you want to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to get to the spiritual aspect too, because I also think it's very important that you know, you had noted in the book that most of the traditions, most of the spiritual traditions are kind of based on getting away from the body. Mm -hmm. And I have found increasingly that any kind of, I don't know if I want to say true spirituality, but if a spirituality doesn't contain the body or doesn't recognize the body, or speak to the body that it's an incomplete spirituality. I love the way you said that. Yes, absolutely. Which is what also that this we'll get into the shoppers a little bit more later if you because that's why we're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, really talk a lot in the book about the importance of what we consider the lower chakras. Mm -hmm. That if we are not connected to our body, we are not having a human experience. Right. This is why we came here. However right. you want to uh, put meaning around the spirituality of why we're here, the light that's within us, we chose these bodies to have some experience. Yeah. Along the way, we probably had some really disturbing experiences that is up to us to, to heal. But yes, right. when we are disconnected from our body, it's incomplete. It's bypassing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that came to mind also when you were speaking a little bit ago is that we need to check in with our bodies and we're so not used to doing that. Yeah. And in the book, you have a lot of exercises in the book for people to mm -hmm. do. And one of them I was familiar with because it comes out of Buddhism and it yeah. is this mindful check of the body. And I think a lot of people think that Buddhism is one of those traditions where, you know, nope, nope, nope. It's all about escaping the body, but it's not, not really. Mm -hmm. And that is so important to kind of check in, you know, and see if there's locations of tension or something within the body. Because there's your message right there. There's your opportunity for leaning in, healing, right. gaining more information. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I, I, Buddhism to me was the first psychology. Yeah, yeah, I I, no, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see it as a psychology and a sort of a philosophy. Yes. I, yeah, I often refer to it as philosophy with ritual. Um, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we're going to get to the chakras here. A uh, couple of things I want to ask about here. Very quickly, I, I want to get us to the polyvagal theory. I wanted to ask you to kind of talk about that a bit, but you had mentioned both EMDR and IFS. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could just say something for the listeners as to what those are referring to. Okay. I'll break them down into their different yeah. modalities. There's different ways of approaching all of this. I've mo eye movement desensitization reprocessing. That was something that was developed. It was a technique that was developed in the 90s yeah. by French Francine Shapiro. And like most modalities, most things, it came from a, a personal experience that she was having where she was realizing she was working through something really intense. Her eyes were going back and forth, mm. like REM sleep. Mm. And she said, well, this must be something. Let me start working with some of my clients. I think I believe at the time, I'm not sure about this, but I know that for a while she was working with vets mm -hmm. with sort of classic PTSD. And so she developed over time a protocol that used follow my hand, eye movement to process out traumas. And it was literally processing them out of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, since then, of course, there, it seems like the 90s was like a really emerging time for a lot of the pieces that heal on the on this level, because around the same time, Stephen Porges was developing his 
polyvagal theory, which of course then deepens the EMDR work. Yes, we're moving our eyes, we're processing out these traumas. There's a, there's a protocol that goes with all this and there's multiple protocols that go with it now because it's, it's really burgeoning. But the eye movement is attached to the vagus nerve. The, you know, the nerves in the eyes are attached to the rest of the vagus nerve. So that certainly makes sense. So start, you start with EMDR studying, and then you start realizing, well, polyvagal theory meshes right up. And then through the years too, I've, I work a lot with, try not to get too psychobabbly here, but I work a lot with attachment work, because if you're working with trauma, you're working with people who had experiences in childhood of how to how to attach and how they connect to people, et cetera. And so inter- internal family systems works a lot with our personality parts. Hmm. And so combining the three of those for me has been wonderful. I do some energy tapping with them for resourcing as well, but they're all they're all part of our central nervous system, how our internal system is response, you know, responding to, to its world. Mm. I hope so, I gave you enough information there. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I just wanted something kind of quick and brief for people who may not be familiar <laughs> um, there, you know, it's the, it's the teacher in me. I always want to and the philosopher. I always want to say, okay, well define that for me. <laughs> well, what does and that I have mean? a tendency to get in the weeds. So yeah. this is really good that you're keeping yeah. me keeping yeah, me here. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it seems to me that so much of this, and you know, I don't want to boil it down to just one or two sentences, but it seems that one of the main things that's going on is that the, the vagal system is designed to help keep us safe, but yet we all experience traumas where we don't feel safe and that we keep repeating those and we start engaging in behaviors that try to mask that unsafe feeling because we want to be safe. And it's all about yeah. kind of going back to that feeling of security and safe safety. We can't have much else unless we feel secure. Right. You right. know, really it's the root chakra. It's in Maslow's hierarchy. You know, it's the real basic needs. Yeah. There was a little weeds there. Sorry about that. That's okay. But <laughs> but we can't we can't be spiritual unless we're feeling safe. Right. And you know, so the vagus nerve is our discernment. It, it's yeah. our biological discernment. Hmm. And of course, you know, so it's 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 keeping us safe. But like I said, we you know we misfire. We misfire hmm. when we've had information that is experiences that have been instilled as information about safety and, and lack of safety. I'm very tempted to want to go into the three branches if if yeah let's do that. That was gonna talk about yeah. that. Yeah that okay. was actually going to be the next question. So okay. <laughs> Don't want to control the interview here. <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. It's it's conversational. So it's not about control. It's about flow. <laughs> okay. We're flowing. We're flowing yeah. into the three yeah. parts of the yeah. the three yeah. branches of the vagus nerve. Sure. You know, I'll go the the first branch, which is actually the the you know, the earliest branches are, it's Mm. very mammalian. It is our safety branch. It's the ventral Mm. vagus. Mm. That is what you and I are applying right now as we're laughing, we're talking, we're looking at each other, even though it's on a screen, there's safety. There's a safety factor. There's an interest. I want to hear Mm. what you have to say. We're, We're sharing ideas. This is ventral vagal safety. This is what we try. I've seen a lot of people online now doing a lot of somatic work, trying to get, Mm. you know, we're trying to get back into our safety mode. The ventral vagus branch of the vagus nerve connects to, as we were saying, the ocular nerves, it connects into the inner ears, it connects to the larynx, all the way down into the throat and the heart. Hmm. It, it, it helps us maintain a steady heartbeat. When we're calm, our heart slows down, our beat slows down, the, the space between the beats slows, right? Hmm. The th- and by the way, none of these branches is wrong. That's the thing that I think we trip up on. It's like, no, we always want to be in ventral. Well, if a tiger comes running into my room, I'm not staying in ventral. Vagal. <laughs> I'll talk to you later because I'm out the door, right? So the the, the mid branch is sympathetic. It's mm. what we you know we've heard sympathetic yeah. nervous system. So the sympathetic is the awareness, is the registering danger. Are we safe? Are we in danger? Where is that tiger? Did Was that just a neighbor making a noise or is there an actual tiger here? So we, our body responds differently. Our, our breaths shorten, our heartbeat raises, our whole 
hormonal axis starts shifting and starts sending cortisol to, to our system, tightening up our muscles. Do we have to run? Do we have to get out of here? Cause the tiger's going to come that keeps us mobile. That keeps us into fight or flight. Do we have to get out of this situation or do we have to fight our way out? That keeps us safe. The third branch is the dorsal vagal. This is our shutdown branch. This is our conserving of energy branch. This is when, when the tiger has you in the mouth and you're still alive, but you don't have anything more to fight with and you collapse. It's possum, yeah. right? The possum, mm. you know, kind of has that yeah. system that does that. It conserves energy. It's, it's, it's an effective form of managing our system. It can get in the way though, when we are perceiving that there's danger when there isn't. Mm. Yeah. It, and, and sometimes our system does the work that our awareness, our system's working it self, our vagus nerve is working itself. When our mind is going, but this isn't, this isn't this thing. This isn't, that was 20 years ago. This is now, but our system is, is still trying to manage what's happening here. Yeah. So would the dorsal vagus, it, would that be when we just want to shut down? Yeah. And just kind of start maybe numbing ourselves a little bit and withdrawing from everything. It can be. Yes. It's, yeah. it's really associated with dissociation. Okay. People who've experienced early childhood trauma, particularly, but we all dissociate on some level mm. when we're in shock, when we've been in a car accident, we're dissociated. Right, right. Our, our system's going, no, no, this is too much. We'll just, just give it a minute. Just, we'll just yeah. kind of help you disappear a little bit. Mm. So yes, it can shut us down. It can help us rest, but it can also shut us down when we're not needing it to mm. as well. So that's just sort of the observing of it. Mm. I'll give you an example. Just this just happened the other day. I had a, a, a loved one years ago die of a heart attack. And this, all the symptoms were there. They were not, they were, they weren't being observed as heart attack symptoms. Fast forward to this month. I have another loved one who's saying, well, I have this symptom and I have this symptom. And of course I, I can feel myself getting a little sympathetic response, right? I'm no longer feeling completely safe. Like, oh, that's nothing. It's like, really? I also live about two blocks away from a hospital. For some reason, it's actually very quiet in my neighborhood, but for some reason, there were a lot of ambulances coming in that day. At that moment, as we're trying to discern what is going on here, mm. I, I could feel myself getting into a little dorsal shutdown. I knew it was happening, but I also was trying very much to keep myself up the ladder, at least into sympathetic. And we discerned this was not a heart attack. The person that we were, I was having this conversation with is also a trauma therapist. <laughs> so <laughs> I could utilize that language going, I'm getting a little dorsally right now. Yeah. Um, and, but, but noticing that that was happening to me instead of just collapsing, I could manage that better. And it's very nuanced. What I did for myself in that case was wrap myself in a blanket on the couch, put my cats and, you know, my my loved one were that we were all there co-regulating mm. so that i was bringing myself back into connecting with safe other central nervous systems mm. and feeling more ventral yeah i mean that was just sort of a it was one of those moments that i was very aware of what was happening and i was very much trying to work my 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 vagus nerve back into safety because we were safe yeah but my system wasn't sure there for a minute okay it seems like the three, I don't know how we, the three systems, I'll just say that. Three branches. To, yeah. The three it's branches. One system. Yeah. Okay. That they all work together because it is yeah. one system, right? Mm -hmm. Because what came to my mind is I used to have really bad anxiety, especially when I was writing my doctoral dissertation, it mm -hmm. was through the roof. And I saw that as that sympathetic nervous system, that that's where it yep. was, uh, especially the fight or flight, you know, the, I, every day I was like, okay, do I keep struggling on or do I just run away from it? Right, right. <laughs> do I stay here and fight yeah. or do I get yeah. out of here? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I remember there was one instance where I thought with a couple of people on my committee were being not 
very helpful. I'll just say that. And I had a really They were creating a lack of safety for you. (laughs) Yeah. And I have a a really good friend, one of my best friends. I would kind of share things and maybe messages and whatnot. And she responded once to one of these messages with something that wasn't very nice Mm -hmm. about these committee members. And when I replied, I later, I thought that I had replied all so that the people, yeah, exactly. Right. All the worst, the worst worst. scenario ever. Yeah. Yeah. And so I already had this anxiety, but then what happened was I was flooded with cortisol. I felt toxic. And then I just went into my bedroom and I completely shut down. I was like fetal position (laughs) for a while. So I, I just give that example as how they kind of work in unison. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Instead of moving into safety because you didn't feel right. safe in that moment, yeah. you, you were shutting down. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And maybe the ventral was in there too, because I felt like I wasn't engaging with them properly or that they weren't engaging with me properly. And maybe that and- was the start of it. Yeah. You know, I talk about this a little bit in the book and you can really get into the weeds again with this. Yeah. If you start wanting to report just this work is that we, we, we engage, we're not only, we're not always in one. Right. I'm trying to think of an example. I think I use this in the book, you know, think about when you're talking, when you're, you're in, I don't know, you've just come in your triage and you've got a ER doc right there. That ER doctor is sympathetic. Hmm. They have to be on point, right? Because mm-hmm. I don't know you know, you're, you're bleeding to death, but they also have to stay calm enough to communicate directives to everybody in the, in the Mm. emergency room to you. So there's a, there's a, an engagement, sort of a back and forth engagement that goes on there where they're in ventral, but they're also getting enough Mm. of that surge to be able to stay present, you know, as well. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That's a really good example. That's a very good example. This is, this is, um, this is probably a fine example. Um, when an example of ventral and dorsal is after sex mm. or during, yeah. you're safe, hopefully. You're feeling mm. safe, you're feeling connected, but you're also kind of out yeah. of it. Right. Right. That's a, that's another example of how the system is is not just it's not just locked into one branch of, of it. Right. It it's a it's a ladder. Yeah. It it goes back up and down, back and forth. Yeah. Uh, it works together because it, it is does. one system, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Very good. All right. So I'm going to assume that my audience is familiar with the chakras. Okay. Um, however, I did want to ask you, how do you think about them? You know, what, what do they mean to you? And what is the relationship between the vagus nerve and the chakras? So my meaning is, is I think a lot of us over the years, the more we work with our etheric energy shifts, right? For me, it, it used to be about, you know, my yoga and my mm-hmm. t- tuning into the particular chakras at certain times. There was also the meaning that, you know, the heart chakra up, that's where you wanted to go. That was the mm-hmm. spiritual center. As I, you know, over the years of doing trauma work and knowing the chakras, the seven main brain, the seven main chakras is really what I'm talking about and watching them play out as I was doing, working with these body, mind modalities. It's like, oh my gosh, this information is coming through this chakra hmm. and this information is about attachment, early attachment, et cetera. So, so, so that's where I started to go with the chakras. And I still kind of now see this overlay with the vagus nerve, how I work and how I see them is I do see that from the, well, going from basically the solar plexus down to the sacral and and the root chakra. This is where I see a lot of our attachment working itself out. Root chakra is about safety. That's the thing that, that's the energy that comes right online. I think before we're probably born, there's no really way, no real way to measure that, but it's survival at, at, its, at its core then you have, you've got your sacral energy, right? Which is really also attached to, you know, your umbilical cord, right? Mm -hmm. This is how you first learn to attach. So when I'm working with early childhood trauma, a lot of the meaning that would shift 
or a lot of the pain, literal pain sometimes, that would be presented in the body were presenting in these two chakras. Mm. Um, sometimes when I would work with clients, I, I'm, I'm not going, okay, this is your sacral chakra and this means this, because then we're putting them up in a brain, right. meaning and not allowing them to be present to the to the the, the processing. And, and even as we get up into the solar plexus, I was seeing that that really forms a lot of our identity in the world, mm. which to me was an overlay in my head about internal family systems. But you know how we are in the world, we are, we are different people in different scenarios, mm. different personalities, different aspects of us. We engage differently. We see ourselves differently. Sometimes we act completely differently. So these three I utilize when I'm really working early childhood stuff. We get into the heart chakra, then we start getting into, by the way, going back to the, 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 the root and the sacral chakra and the solar plexus, these are attached to the subdiaphragmatic aspects of the vagus nerve. Subdiaphragmatic, obviously the diaphragm, the communication is slower. They're, they're not coded. Mm. They're not fiber coated. <laughs> they're unmyelinated, which is, right. you know, I'm trying not to get in the weeds here. The information is slower, it, but it's it's processing through the diaphragm, the sex organs, all in through this area. That's one of the reasons we he- feel such punches sometimes, mm. because we're feeling it in our stomach and our lower intestines and our, yeah. you know. Anyway, so then we get into the heart chakra, the throat chakra, third eye, and even the crown. We're getting into ventral vagal. We're getting into these safety factors. It doesn't mean though that our heart doesn't feel the pain of of a loss because of course the heart is that attachment through love and it's attachment through safety, you know, ventral vagal. So you can almost see people as they're working through their experiences, having different sensations through these chakras as well as the vagus nerve. It just seems to all kind of correspond in these areas and and the meaning the dimensions the mm-hmm. aspects that these chakras sort of represent as us in human form mm-hmm. kind of reveal themselves throat chakra i think it's becoming one of my favorite chakras to work with mm-hmm. when you have people who grew up and they're they're they, they weren't heard they were told that you know whatever they said wasn't important they were screamed at whatever the the dynamic was there are times when people's literal throat chakra if he was so if i was doing reiki on them i'd say oh your throat chakra is really blocked Mm -hmm. but i also know now too the psychological aspects of that the attachment parts of that and i've had clients that have worked with through the years with their trauma in that regard who've gone Mm -hmm. from not being able to speak Mm -hmm. and having pain in their throat when they're working through their early childhood stuff to fairly loquacious <laughs> really yeah. loving to talk and and it's really wonderful to see the, and i can almost see the energy shift in there mm. as well mm. yeah that's interesting i'll share this when i was a teenager i my 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 first huge crush the day that they broke up with me and we weren't mm. actually together because they had someone else oh, but anyway loves. yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're really good friends now. But right after that happened, I lost my voice. I lost my voice for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And there have been a few times in my life that that's happened. And it's definitely feeling kind of disempowered in many yes. ways that I can't speak what's on my heart, that I can't speak my truth. So I find that really fascinating. Very yeah. And the interplay, the interplay between the throat chakra and the heart chakra is very interesting too. Yeah. Donna Eden's work. I, I mentioned this in the book. Mm-hmm. Hope someday to meet her. She talks about, you know, that what she has seen through the years in regards to the throat chakra are channels. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, I was like, well, of course, because by the way, the, the vagus nerve is bilateral right? We look at it from the side, you can see the three branches, but you look at it from the front, just like the brain, it is bilateral. So we have, and, and it becomes, it starts becoming more bilateral once it moves up from the heart or yeah, from the heart, the heart chakra back up into the ears. So it, thinking it makes sense that these mm. have this throat, this throat chakra is far more complex. Mm. And I think it's actually the most powerful one because 
this is the only chakra that we create through where there's sound. Mm. And it's a powerful chakra because we have to be aware of what we're saying, what we're doing, the sounds. And then there's a whole branch of polyvagal theory in regards to prosody, how we respond to different uh, variations of sound and voice, et cetera, too. Mm. Yeah, something that comes to mind is that with the vagal system, with what you were just saying, especially with the throat chakra and that you've got things going on two sides, is Mm -hmm. that I was just thinking of the chakra system in general, where you have this sort of central column, and then you have, I think they're called the nadis, Mm -hmm. uh, where the energy is flowing up and down and circulating. And it seems like the ancient yogis that came up with this system were intuiting, I think, the vagal system. Absolutely. And that's to me where the way I work, that's where energy psychology, the tapping comes in Mm -hmm. because we're pretty much tapping the meridians and we're still moving uh, energy through anxiety, through sadness, through absolutely. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Another thing about the throat chakra, adding to that, um, the OM that Buddhist monks have been doing for how many thousands of years, that OM brings you down into a level of prosody, brings you down into a mid range in the, in the throat that, that, that situates and pulls into and engages the ventral vagal. Mm. Mm. If you shrieked right now, if I shrieked at you right now, you'd be like, you you would tense (laughs) up, you would not feel safe. Oh my gosh. Right. So, so the higher pitches feel unsafe to our system. Right. Right. And, and if, because you have a deeper voice than me, if you got really mad and started to get really deep and loud, I would be thinking, oh, I'm not safe with him. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not coming back. <laughs> right, 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 right. Right. So, so there's a mid range in our voice mm. that the poor just refers to as uh, prosody. There's also prosody that has to do with poetry. That's mm, not what he's yeah. necessarily referring to here. Right. So there's a mid range that helps us feel safe. Mm. Yeah. And what I like about this, the the ohm and kind of feeling safe is also that ohm is supposed to be the sound of the universe, the sound of the creator and the creation. And so it seems like it grounds us in a very significant way. Um, And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you feel that safety of the universe, you're going to feel the safety, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the deeper you go with the ohm, It goes down into your belly. Yeah. yeah. So it's really, you know, softening our central nervous system, our vagus nerve. Of course, back then they probably had no concept of vagus nerve, et cetera. They just were intuiting it, like you Mm -hmm. said. So, so why aren't we, why aren't we overlaying all this? Right, right, right. Well, if you hear OM done right, you feel it. You yes. feel it. I've done this yes. in classes and my students are always so timid, but I will, when I talk about Om, when I'm covering the Indian religious traditions, I'll say, okay, mm-hmm. let's do this. You know, let's all just sit here because you can feel it. And they never do it. Right. They're always really timid. Like, oh, I'm like, no, you have to, the room needs to vibrate, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've never been able to get them to do it. One of the things that you said brought something to mind. And I don't know if this is a correct way of thinking about this, but I was thinking in terms of kind of the connection between the chakras and the vagus system is it seemed to me like there's something synchronous uh, that is happening. That was like the best word I could come up with in terms of Mm -hmm. like, because I was thinking like synchronicity, but it doesn't really fit that, but it seems like there's something synchronous perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think when you get into your combining science with the etheric, the etheric is one of those things we experience. So we can only on some level guess at it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, maybe, you know, in the next 50 years, they'll be able to measure and, and, yeah. and have all sorts of studies. I'm, I'm, I'm the observer of this. Right. I'm sharing my observation. I'm not sharing my yeah. studies of it, right. but absolutely. It, it is very synchronistic. And, you know, when we are not like you were using the example of your throat, right. Probably in connection to your heart, the emotion in there, the energy in your chakra was closing up mm-hmm. along with the fact that your vagus nerve was yeah. not feeling safe. And it was 
not feeling connected with yeah when it when it is flowing i mean our chakras are 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 the beacons mm. i almost see them as our little like whoever's watching over us you know a little light beacons out there oh there she is oh look at she's having a little bit of problem with her relationships yeah. right now because there's yeah. her sacral chakra energy is not quite yeah. you know extending in the way it yeah. should you know i've seen people like if if we're too open mm. I'll use this as an example. I have to use this as a really generalized example, but I know someone that really struggles with codependency and I've been able to kind of see within their sacral chakra an openness. It's a, it's almost like a, a flatulent kind of energy in here. Hmm. And, was, you know, it's just interesting to observe that because this person has really bad boundaries of people, hmm. really open, non-restrictive because you can go the other way. We have everything is rigid boundaries I thought that was really interesting that 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 energy center was just so too open, mm. oh, f- almost flaccid. I mean, it was just yeah. kind of that's the way that I would describe that. And that was the way that she managed her world with people, other mm. people. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, one of the things that you noted, which given, you know, I, I know a little bit about the chakras and I'm learning more because as I told you before, you know, coming from, you know, I'm trained in philosophy and philosophy teaches you how to think, right? And it's a very scientific kind of thinking and you want evidence for things. And so I had always been kind of suspect of the chakras, but it's the experiences where I'm like, wait a minute, there's something going on here. And when I looked at, you know, past history, you know, like when I lost my voice, I mean, yeah, there's definitely something going on there. And one of the things, you know, the root chakra, I, I, because I wanted to talk about that, you know, we're not going to go through all the chakras because we want people to read your book. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Forgot about uh, that part. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I think most people always assume, those who know about the chakras, they always assume that spirituality is centered in the third eye and the crown chakra. But you noted that the root chakra is one of the most spiritual chakras that we possess. I I think so. Personally, when I am meditating in a way that utilizes that energy, I'm conscious of it, maybe doing some visualization, I make sure that I engage my crown, my third eye, and my root. Mm. Because it grounds me to the earth as I'm connecting outward. Mm. But also our bodies are are our indicators of what's what's going on in our experiences. So if we're not attuned to that, and I mean, who knows, it's going to take at least decades for us to get out of this belief that our bodies are our enemies yeah. and, and to stop treating our bodies as our enemies. Yeah. But absolutely, it grounds us to the earth. It's, it's bringing in other information. Yeah. It's bringing in information about the earth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people who, who work with elementals, I'm going mm. really out of the box here, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, fine. elementals yeah. and and energies of the earth. Mm-hmm. How else would we connect to them if it wasn't for that yeah. root chakra? Yeah. Well, and I started thinking about a lot of different things as I was reading your book. And uh, also when I was compiling some notes for this discussion, you know, I liked the idea of what you just said, that it, it includes a connection to the earth. Mm-hmm. And that is something that we definitely need right now um, Mm -hmm. because we are so disconnected to the earth and the root chakra like you said you know i think you wrote noted in the book and this is what you just said that it reveals the physical aspects of who we are and it's connected to surviving and thriving Mm -hmm. and one of the things that i liked and i was thinking about this kind of personally and it's all share a little bit here with you but with each of the chakras you also discuss their highest expression and their lowest expression. And I thought that these were both very valuable, especially in the root chakra, where Mm -hmm. the highest expression was attunement. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I was wondering, and I do want to go into that lowest expression in conversation, uh, but (laughs) I was wondering if you could say a few things about attunement. It's, it's so intentional right? To attune to your body takes intention. It takes a little bit, it takes a lot of trust, Mm. but it also takes the understanding that 
there's going to be experiences here that we might not be able to define through our mind, or at least mm. not yet. Mm. Attunement is, it's not, yeah, it's not just an emotional attunement right. because, right. because our attunement of emotions actually is felt through the body. Mm. So uh, as we are tuning to this love we feel for somebody, we feel that love in our body. If we are attuned to where we're feeling it in our body, if we're feeling fear, we feel that in our body. So the attunement to our system, our body is vital. And, you know, again, I, I watch that. I mean, you know, my years, my, my personal years of yoga and a lot of just my own spiritual quests, that was one aspect of it, but then really seeing people having to attune to their body as they're working out these traumas had a whole other layer to it because you have to trust the pain the shutdown, the intensity in your body enough to know that the information is there to work through it and to have it shift into a whole level of experience and meaning. Yeah. When I was thinking of attunement, you know, you talked about everything you just said about bringing balance and really connecting to the body. But I also am thinking in terms of, you know, the importance of recognizing our physicality as mm. being natural beings because we yes. have this disconnect that is yeah. the source of so many problems where we tend to make this th this distinction between culture and nature and it seems to me that part of the root chakra is to see ourselves as natural physical beings not just existing in this sort of abstract sort of culture that we've created for ourselves oh wow yeah, I love that. Yeah. And yeah, that we're not disconnected. Yeah, right. And I don't know the etymology of attunement, but what comes to mind is tune. Mm -hmm. And going from tune, I was thinking, you know, maybe another way of expressing this attunement would be harmony. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I I didn't bring her work into the book because it felt like it was going, going to go in a different direction. But I think it's Chloe. I hope I'm right at this. Chloe Goodyear, I think, does a lot of work on music, tone, throughout the chakras as well. Yeah, yeah. And that would connect to that throat chakra too. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, they're all connected. They're all connected. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what I also found interesting is the lowest expression is control. And... I see this and I've been guilty of this, of wanting to control everything. And we all have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I learned a very valuable lesson in regards to this. And so I don't want to hog the interview with my stuff, but I told you before we started recording that going back at least into November, I've had some, I had some physical issues with a shoulder and arm and it literally hurt when I sat. Mm -hmm. um, and so it actually started in that root chakra area. Right. Mm -hmm. And I even had a dream and all the dream was, is I was like lying on a bed or something. And there were these two women and one lifted up my legs and the other one just pointed. And, and when I woke up from that dream, I'm like, I think they're pointing to my root chakra there. And I had a, I had three different people tell me mm -hmm. that I had energy blockages. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas was the root chakra and the other mm -hmm. was the heart, both of those. Um, my third eye apparently was so open, it could have been a portal. But the, 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 that root chakra was really there. And I was like, I don't know, how do I fix this. So I started doing yoga and that helped a lot doing day, have, getting into a daily yoga practice. But I went on a plant medicine retreat in February and there was this, you know, we were all in the room and we were, everyone was kind of like lying down on these mats. And I was trying to have this experience of the medicine and I couldn't because of all the sounds and the noise and everything that was going on around me. And I would try to go in and something would just like pull me out. Mm -hmm. And I've always been very sensitive to sounds. I've always mm -hmm. been very sensitive to sounds and it was just so distracting. So 
I, I approached one of the people who is behind all of this. And I told her, I'm like, this isn't working. And she's like, talk about it tomorrow. Talk about it tomorrow. But what I learned was, and she eventually told me this, is she's like, you know, you need to learn. You can't control what's going on around you. <laughs> I think that's the, the only, gist of any therapy ever. <laughs> that the only thing you can control is how you respond. Yeah. And I, and it clicked for me then. And I saw how much I do that. And I think that so many of us are doing that. And I see that as the root <laughs> of so much of our suffering in the world today is that everyone's trying to control everything else because we are in such situation. I, I want to see if I can find it here because you talk about it is our lifestyles right now that mm -hmm. is constantly stressing us. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I so want to see people healing from this. <laughs> you know, it seems like it's so crucial for where we are now. And that as physical beings, we have been trying to control nature and the world mm -hmm. we live in. Oh, gosh, and, yes. and that has led us to this situation where everything is out of whack. Yeah, that white European culture that believes somehow that we yeah. could control nature, somehow we could control yeah. everything. Absolutely. And, you know, as a therapist, I can tell you, <laughs> I would want to see everybody healed too, Yeah. but everybody's on their own journey. That is true. And, and within that, we can't control right. those right. who really aren't open to Yeah. Uh, looking at things differently or doing yeah, things yeah. differently for themselves or whatever it is, right, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, got to release yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> and and as a very Buddhist mindset, yeah. not attaching to outcome. Right, yeah, yeah, good point. Very good point. Yeah, I still have work to do. We I, I think we, you do. know what? I think we, we will till, till, till wherever we go back to is, yeah. you know, I, I think that that's oh, yeah. just part of, we're in a workshop. Oh yeah. Yeah. We certainly we can are. make it hard on ourselves or we can make it easier on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. The, I, I don't want to talk about the heart chakra here a little bit too, because I also had an experience with that, but the heart chakra, love and hate, the highest expression is love and the lowest expression was hate. And you said something that or you wrote something that I really liked about that. And you said that people stay connected through their hatred. Mm -hmm. So do whole communities and countries, but hatred oh. is still a bond. <laughs> I just felt, I actually yeah. just felt that in my heart, yeah. in my heart chakra. Yeah. How many people spend decades hating their ex Yeah. or yeah. gossiping about somebody that allegedly did them wrong? You know, there's a, there's, I was wondering that the other day, I was like, what is the hormonal attachment to hatred? You know, what is mm. the... I'm, there may be some research out there. I don't know what the I don't know what the research is, but there's there's got to be some some hit, some endorphin mm. hit about staying in that hatred, mm. the hatred of the other. And of course, we're seeing this. Oh yeah, a lot over yeah. the last couple of decades. Yeah, well, I see a lot of hatred, and I see all of that connect, connected in many ways to control as well. You know, bingo. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it makes me think in terms of you know looking at sort of the larger picture, not just the individual, but if you look at health statistics, maybe mm -hmm. for like the nation, that tells you a lot of things about where our energy is not working. And, yeah. you know, like heart disease and heart issues are one of the number one killers in the nation. Yeah. And it seems to me that what that's saying is that we have we have an issue with our heart, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a country. And that's something mm -hmm. that we need to address and try to fix. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm, it, I have a generalized understanding of this, but I'm, I'm not a scientist. I know that there's a lot of science behind this, a lot mm -hmm. of the stress that indicates how this contributes to all sorts of diseases, particularly heart disease. Mm -hmm. And this is all representative in our heart chakra, in our ventral vagal safety portions because if we're not feeling safe yeah. our body is constantly you know promoting stress factors here all all, all of 
the aspects of it, the cortisol that runs through our system, et cetera, that creates all sorts of health issues. Yeah, we're, we're just, we're so intricate. Yeah. Well, and safety has been such a huge issue, especially after 9-11, mm-hmm. um, that I've been saying for a long time that we are all traumatized one way or uh, another, you know. Which which culminated with two years of a major pandemic yeah, yeah. in the beginning where people weren't sure if they yeah. were going to live or die. Right. And yeah. I, I'm curious, when did, because I only recently started hearing about the vagus nerve. When did this start coming to attention? Because it seems going back to this idea of being synchronous, it seems like this information is really starting to come into the consciousness at the time that we really need it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So I had a friend who's an academic who said that that initially you've got about 10 years where something is studied within, you know, the the halls of academia. Hmm. Then it starts reaching itself out into sort of the professional world, which is what really the Vegas, you know, the polyvagal theory did. And then it starts reaching out into general public. Mm. And I think we're at that point. And, Mm. you know, it just the whole concept of EMDR sort of being developed in the 90s, polyvagal theory coming on board. I mean, there was there were a lot of like I was saying, a lot of this stuff that that pulls together Mm. that by the time we are in this scenario where we've had, what, 20 some odd years September 11th, all the other things that are going on, the people in the world that are the most fearful are the most, are acting out in the fear and being the the most uh, hateful to others. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all, we're all manifesting what we have in our own, in our own psyche. So yeah, yeah, it's almost as if, it's almost as if this whole thing was times that, that it's starting to get out into the general public. Right. Yeah. I always love it when things like that happen, Yeah. you know, because it's, serendipitous you know maybe that's another way of saying it rather than synchronous but it's so necessary right now so absolutely necessary maybe there are some bigger patterns of play that we can't even fathom yeah 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 and you know it the the heart one of the things i wanted to ask is that it seems to me and maybe i'm taking this in a direction I shouldn't be taking us, but, you know, we hold these traumas within our bodies. And I think that they can then lead to very serious illness, can't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know, trying to pull an example out of my head really quickly. Absolutely. I mean, digestive issues Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is a grand example of that. I was going to say women who've been raped, but men, men are raped too. People who are sexually assaulted and abused and raped end up with all sorts of lower abdominal issues sometimes mm-hmm. if they choose to push it back and not heal it. Mm-hmm. Because when we push it back, we're holding on to it. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to manifest in whatever way, you know, it's, it's creating issues for us. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this and it's, I, I I don't know, maybe we're stuck with the word. I have issues with it just because of the connotations, which is psychosomatic, that, you know, what's going on in the mind can manifest in the body. And people tend to read that as, well, it's all in your head. Yeah. And it's an older term anyway. And, and yeah. gosh, I wish I'd, I looked up the etymology of psychosomatic because yeah. I mean, I remember hearing that way before I, I yeah. did this work. So it's been around for a long time. I don't know what, you know, where, what its roots are, yeah. but it does have a bit of a negative. It has quite a negative connotation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all in your mind. You're creating these problems from your mind. Right. Right. You know, there, there are some better terms for that, that we could probably create, you know, the biophysiological, there was, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to pull it off out of my brain right now. There was for a while, a term psychobiological, which was a mm. study, Okay. you know, so I don't think anybody's really rested on a particular framework now for this, 
But I mean, you could throw around a lot of different terms about this being, you know, biophysiological, you know, but, yeah. but I agree with you that that psychosomatic is, is quite condescending. It's probably Freudian yeah. it, with its yeah, roots. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, I, I think Freud had, you know, I, I know he was wrong in so many ways, but you know, when we look at the lowest expression of the root chakra and control, Freud jumps to mind, yes. <laughs> you know, with like potty <laughs> training and right. Yeah. And Jung being one of proto, one of the protégés of Freud, Jung's yeah. up here. So, so we've yeah. got like these, the, our, our roots yeah. start with the root and the third yeah. eye. Yeah. And then we're all meeting in between now here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, maybe one of the disconnects, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to articulate this the way I want to is, and this is still with the psychosomatic, but I'm trying to connect it with what you're writing about in your work is that I, I think in our culture, we have this tendency when there's a sickness, when there's something in the body, you know, we make a disconnect with the mind or the soul or something. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, it's like, well, here, take these pills, or we're going to cut this out, something like that. And we don't actually get to the roots of the problem. And there's no thinking in terms of energetic blockages, I think. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that such an important component of actual healing is to take into account mm -hmm. those energetic blockages mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that we can actually prevent having to take a bunch of these pills or having this cut out. Yeah. 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 I think there's a balance in all that too. Cause I think, yeah. you know, if we think about how we are just simply exposed to toxins in the world and we yeah. develop medical issues as a result, I, you know, there's a, there's gotta be a balance in it. Cause I, I, I will hear people say, well, if you weren't thinking this way, then you wouldn't have had this happen either. <laughs> right, right, right. So right. there's a little shaming in, in some right, of that. Right. And I think that this is, I'm strictly per talking from my own personal experience because I, I, I have been in the world of energy and, mm -hmm. and I love the energetic world and the etheric and the rate Reiki and intuitive processing. I'm starting to believe that it's an inside out job. Yeah. So a lot of the energy blockages that you were experiencing were because of if it was early childhood stuff, or it's just the way you were managing your world mm -hmm. and, and how you were, how the meaning that you were making was, was creating all these physiological responses. Mm -hmm. And then it manifests outward as blockages. Right. Yeah. I, th I feel that perhaps these days, if we can look at it inside out, and not dismiss so-called psychology right. as unspiritual. Because, you know, I, I have many people who work in different spiritual modalities, energy modalities, but won't do the work, mm. won't go back and see this, this pain that they're carrying around that, that stemmed from early childhood, whatever, right. trauma or messaging. And as a result, it manifests into all these relational things. So I think there's a balance in there. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's depending upon what we're healing. Mm. I think we have to do the inside out work yeah. Yeah. and and it all reflects, it all flows. Yeah. 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 What are no, your I, thoughts on that? No, I, I, <laughs> I totally agree. And, you know, one is I always, you know, I'm kind of a Jungian, um, uh, mm -hmm. many ways. So I always want to take psychology back to the root where psyche is not just mine, it's soul. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, no, sorry. I was going to jump all over that because yeah. the whole premise of my book, we get, you know, I, I, I end up having to sort of explain a lot about the science behind it, tra what trauma and the concept of trauma and the polyvagal theory and our vagus nerve and then the chakras. But the whole premise of the book is the healing is what brings mm -hmm. us to our soul. Right. And we can't access soul if we're, we're, we're maneuvering around it, yeah. around all these other things, trying to get to soul. If we can heal the body clear the trauma from our, our, our central nervous system, we have quick access to who we yeah. already are. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I was going to say, this is again, a kind of a personal experience. One of these days, my brother is going to tell me, you need to quit talking about this, but. <laughs> oh uh, no, family story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's applicable and it's, and it's with that heart chakra. 
Yeah. And I had a guest on a while back, Ed Tick, and he's he comes out of the Jungian tradition and he leads mm -hmm. people onto these journeys, especially to Greece and to Vietnam. And mm -hmm. he works a lot with veterans and trauma mm -hmm. that veterans have gone through. And so I kind of told this story when I was speaking with him, but I'll share this with you because I think this is relevant. And it's kind of the way I'm thinking about this healing process mm -hmm. is my dad was a veteran. He mm -hmm. did two terms in Vietnam, mm -hmm. never spoke about it, never, ever talked about it. Absolutely refused. Eventually, a little bit later in his life, he developed, it took the doctors a long time to figure out what was happening because he was either diagnosed as having congestive heart failure or pneumonia or both. Eventually, what they determined was that the, his pericardium, that's the sac that the heart sits mm -hmm. in, had calcified. And so his heart was not able to beat properly. And so that's why he kept filling up with fluids. And so what they did is they said, okay, what you need is you have to have a pericard pericardium ectomy. <laughs> they had to remove <laughs> the pericardium, right? So that his heart could beat properly. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, my dad made it through the surgery, but he never made it out of intensive care. Uh, but what was, yes, thank you. What was interesting though, is that my brother, when my dad really started getting sick, and my brother was way closer to my dad than I was. We were raised very differently. I lived mostly mm -hmm. with my grandparents, my brother, my parents were there in my brother's life the entire time. Mm -hmm. And they still mm -hmm. lived very close to each other. So it was constant. When my dad started getting really sick, my brother started developing some symptoms and he started developing a lot of the same symptoms. Wow. And he spent the month that my dad, it was like right after my dad passed away, my brother spent an entire month in the hospital and they were like, mm -hmm. what's going on? What's going on? And eventually I think they settled that he was having the effects of some like virus or something, but he had to have the exact same operation because he was filling up with fluids and he had the same surgeon and the surgeon said, this is not something that's genetic. I don't know why this is happening. Mm. And I even told my sister-in-law at the time, I'm like, I think there's something psychosomatic here, that there mm -hmm. is something in regards to the relationship with my dad and my brother, and that it's manifesting in this way. And mm -hmm. I think she took me as saying, oh, it's just in his head. And I was like, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So for me, you know, I'm going to go back to that plant medicine retreat. And one of the things that I learned was I had this experience of, I'm going to try to keep this short. Uh, one day, one morning, when I was really frustrated because I wasn't having the insights or experiences that I thought I was going to be having, I started feeling this pain in my shoe. I even developed a limp because it hurt. And I had taken my shoe off and it was like feeling on the bottom of the shoe, you know, in the sole very quickly. And there was nothing there. I took my sock off and was like shaking it out, shaking the shoe out and nothing seemed to work. And eventually I got so tired of this. I'm like, I need to get down to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. So I took the shoe off and I very closely was feeling, and then I felt it. And it was like this little pin prick. So I then turned the shoe over and there was a burr that had gotten into my shoe and that burr was a good two inches. And fortunately oh it went at an angle, right? And I really had to dig that burr out. But once I did, it was very cathartic for me. And I felt like I was just releasing all of that frustration that I had experienced the night before. Mm -hmm. And it left. It Fantastic left. metaphor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. what happened is that the last day we had this time where we were supposed to find a place in nature and connect with nature. And it was kind of cold, but I eventually found, I went towards this bush and I got up to this bush and this was in Joshua tree. And all of a sudden I saw something really green, vibrant, beautiful green. And so I stepped aside and there was this beautiful cactus it was a little ball cactus, bright, vibrant green that was full of all these barbs all around it. And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, oh, it's the mama. That's where the burr came from. And I don't think it was. But then I'm like, that's my heart. <laughs> that's the lesson I have to learn here is that. And then it immediately hit me with the family dynamics 
of mm -hmm. brother, you know, son, and you know, the two sons and the dad, mm -hmm. where for me it was manifesting in a different way. And it was man, you know, I had told you that I had gone to see a acupuncturist mm -hmm. and he didn't speak that much English, but he told me I was blocked in my heart area. And he's like, your, your energy's all, Ur! I'm like, yes, that's right. And I felt this release after these experiences. And so, and it, when I was reading your book and I came up to this, you know, and the heart chakra is green. And I was thinking of that green cactus mm -hmm. and it, it seems to me that for healing to happen, you know, yeah, we're all on our own journeys. I, I, I wish that my brother and my dad could have had access to something that would have spoken to their souls and allowed them to feel that so that yeah. maybe they wouldn't have had these experiences. Right. And so sorry for sharing all, all of that, but what you were writing just kind of made me think about all of that and how mm -hmm. the system that we exist in, it would have been nice of instead of trying to determine exactly what was going on physically with both of them, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there was also this energetic and yeah. psychological component as well. The one thing that comes up for me too, is we, we shouldn't, but we sometimes pull in other people's energies. Yeah. And who knows where that leads us to. Yeah. Yeah. You and know, families, and, it's going to be difficult not to. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Depending upon how close you are to this person. Yeah. Yeah. Or how enmeshed, not even close, but yeah. how enmeshed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that what I like about your work is that it does, there's this prompt of pay attention to your body, go in. And, you know, it gets back to that idea of that physical disconnect. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you wrote was none of us can live a full, balanced, prosperous, loving, sensuous life if we're physically disconnected from it. Mm -hmm. And that it's through our bodies that we connect with our souls. Thank you for quoting that. Of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, I worked for a long time with people who struggle with eating disorders mm. and it's, it's never the food, right? It's, it's the, it's the, uh, maybe sometimes it's, it's the, it's the control. It's mm. the needing to put boundaries up perhaps mm. because of an enmeshed family or whatever, but, but regardless of whether or not it goes on the spectrum of restriction or binging or even binge purging, we are, we're trying to control the wrong things. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to control our body instead of listening to it and letting it operate for us mm. as a messaging center. Yeah. And that's a root chakra thing too, right? We're trying to control totally. our body. Yeah. 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 So, the, you know, the, the other thing I know we're going to, we're starting to run out of time here, but another quote that you had, I think this may have actually been a header for one section was avoidance of pain is avoidance of a life well lived. And I was thinking specifically in regards to my father and my dad in that, my, my father and my dad, my father and my brother in that aspect, because I don't think that my father ever healed that trauma of the war. And I think that that trauma got put onto my brother in particular, and that he hasn't healed from that either. And I can see both of them kind of disconnecting and avoiding the pain yeah yeah absolutely it's interesting the burdens that we carry yeah. down the lines in our generations yeah yeah so you give a lot of exercises in the book for people mm -hmm. and we already mentioned one of the buddhist meditation of checking in with the body mm -hmm. i was wondering if there was one that you had um just to help people to start checking in with their energies and their chakras and the vagal system is there an exercise that you would recommend that would be really helpful to get people started you know it's really interesting this sounds overly simplistic but just walking mm. and here's why not not walking as a goal or an exercise routine or anything else but just mindful walking 
because what we're doing is going back to our basics. Mm. We are one step in front of the other, right? We're generally doing this outside unless we can't. Mm. So we're connecting to our surroundings. We're creating this bilateral, natural, built-in bilateral stimulation within our vagus nerve and our brain, by the way, because you know the brain's mm. bilateral as well. And if we can just be aware of how we are walking, what we are experiencing in our body as we're walking, mm. you can really start feeling the energy centers in your chakra system yeah. because you are just naturally working your central nervous system in a way that mother nature intended. Mm. So would this be like when you're out walking, it seems like you would actually have to pay attention that mm -hmm. you can't really be necessarily listening to a podcast or, you know, something, mm -hmm. you know, on your headphones, but you really want to have that awareness of what's going on in the body. Yes, absolutely. I don't walk with music. I, I cycle too. Mm. That's my, my big kind of mm. alpha push. I like to get out on my road bike and go, right, right. but I never do it with music. Mm. I don't, it just, I need to stay present to me mm. in those, in those times. And I, it helps me to feel so much more centered in my own energy afterwards, whether, it, you know, I said, if it's just a gentle walk around the neighborhood mm. from, you know, power cycling or whatever, it just, it's, I don't know, it just somehow resets the body okay. and the energy centers. Yeah. But, you know, you're talking about the mindfulness of, of the walking life is about mindfulness It's about being mm -hmm. present. There are mm -hmm. times when it gets a little hard, you know, we, we, we do have to push back a little bit. I mean, we can't stay in intensity all the time, but even in those moments when we're feeling like I was expressing, I mm -hmm. felt myself going a little dorsal vagal the other night. Mm -hmm. It was like, I have to stay present to the fact that I want to go dorsal. Yeah. It's <laughs> my yeah. term. It's, that is what helps us to, to manage the system, the, yeah. the ebb and the flow of the system. Well, it also seems like it could be a prompt for us as well to, when we notice something to start an inquiry, you know, so like, you yes. know, if there's something going on with the heart, you know, to think about it in terms of the heart chakra and say, okay, you know, that is symbolic of all of these things. How is that, how may that apply to what's going on with me? Absolutely. And, you know, that, that experiencing the somatic process, when I start with clients, I have them checking in have, mm. and, you know, some people are more resistant than others. Mm. Some people want to engage brain into the meaning of what they're experiencing, yeah. but this is where it starts. If we can yeah. just trust it just a little bit at a time. And we can just slow it down enough to listen to whatever the message is, the bottom up, you know, mm -hmm. the body yeah. Yeah. sending the signals yeah. to the brain. Yes. And that, you know, is also, I can make a connection to the retreat I went to because that was the big lesson for me because I'm an academic. I'm always in my head. Mm -hmm. And the message was, I have to be in my heart. And a very wise person said something that the longest journey is from the head to the heart. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like that is, you know, it's not just the heart in your book, but it seems like, you know, what you just said, that that is the journey that many of us, I think, need to take is we need to start being more heart centered rather than up here. Absolutely. And, you know, you were referencing the love versus the hate. Love is a really, first of all, in our English language, we don't have a lot of variations on that theme. Right. right. And I wish I spoke other languages so that I knew those yeah. variations with mm -hmm. different languages. But but love can be about just intention, respect, because we think self-love is is somehow a constant elation of experience or mm -hmm. you know, we we can just be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. We can just start with some real basic respect and mm. honoring and yeah. being curious. Yeah. And it's not selfish. You know, we, no. you know, we, we have to begin, you know, I'm sorry, I've got RuPaul in my head now that, you know, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love anyone else? Right. <laughs> you know, right. And, and how you care and love for yourself. Yeah. That's the only, that's the barrier that the barrier, that's the, the bar by which someone mm. else is going to do that. For you so yeah. we want all this great romantic love but if you're not caring for yourself right 
you can't pull that in. Right. It's, yeah. It's there's an energy there. There's a there's right, a right. You know, you're yeah. pulling in the only thing you got in here, and it's going to be it's going to match your energy. Right. Right. Yeah. There's a you're going to attract the vibration. Right. That mm -hmm. you're you're going to attract what you're vibrating out. It's going to come back to you. Yeah. 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 I see that. I see that all around. <laughs> yep. We cannot expect anybody to love us more than we love ourselves. Right. Right. And it's so important to love ourselves. At the very least, yeah. respect ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, we are with our, we are with ourselves all our lives. So why not love ourselves? <laughs> right. <laughs> Otherwise it's just one hell of a journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, if you don't, yeah, yeah, you're just carrying around someone I don't like. It's horrible. Yes, horrible. it's a, it's a yeah. bumpy ride. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know some of the different things of love, but yeah, the good old philos, that sort of brotherly love. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I don't know that the Greeks have. I guess, I, yeah, I don't know if they had a term for kind of like self love. Yeah, because agape yeah. is agape is is yeah, more of a, a universal love of yeah yeah. 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 And then there's the Eros, which is more of the erotic love. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm not familiar if there's another one for the self. That's interesting. I'll have to look actually have up. a friend who's a linguist and yeah. speaks multiple languages. I probably need to ask him that question. You yeah. know, what's, what's that? What's the, what language has that? Right. That word that ref, represents yeah. self-love. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> Well, and I think that that's a, a pretty good place to try to bring this to an end. So let me ask you just two final questions. One is, what are you working on next? Right now, I have, I'm not, I'm still seeing clients. I'm, I've got a couple of books formulating in my head. I'm, I'm kind of mm -hmm. stewing and, and brewing and mm -hmm. letting things formulate. I'm a writer at heart because we talked offline. I'm previously a journalist before I started on this journey. So there's always something that I want to write, talk about. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. I will let you know. Yeah, please do <laughs> oh, so. Let me get please back to so. you on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do so. So the final question then is, do you have a, a website or anything where people can go to find out more about you and your work? I do. I cjlewellen.com. I'm still building that out. I'm still kind of trying mm -hmm. to formulate this. I, I did something that I'm actually really enjoying. I just started a TikTok account oh. <laughs> where I, I know it sounds, you know, I feel like I'm a teenager, but I, I do quick videos about mm. what trauma looks like. What's the vagus nerve? What, mm. And it's, it's fun for me because we break it down in, into little snippets and I am kind of blown away just in the last mm. couple of days how many people are responding and listening and asking questions. Hmm. So that's, I think CJ Llewellyn author uh, okay. is the, but I'm building a lot of this out. I think I've been doing, focusing more on the work than the actual promotion of this, but the yeah. promotion's fun. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. I'm not on TikTok either. I've tried to, and I can do this on YouTube and other places where I wanted to take little snippets out of my podcast interviews Mm -hmm. But just the nature of how I'm doing the podcast, it doesn't really lend itself to like one minute. Yeah. <laughs> so no, you're that you're the podcast that I want to really listen to when yeah. I'm in the car for an hour or two and yeah. really get deep into yeah. the, the conversation. Yeah. 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 But I know my audience would be much larger if I got onto TikTok. So yeah. you know, sometimes it's just, it's just what it is. Yeah. 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 Well, I may be there eventually. We'll see. <laughs> well, well see. I will see you on TikTok. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, I'll go on there and I'll see if I can get your address so I can put it into the show notes in the video yeah. description. So. And I've got, I've got, you know, Facebook, I've been on that for a while. It started as seven dimensions and then okay. it's CJ Llewellyn. Okay. Um, but, right. you know, I think I do want to start doing some, some workshops eventually here yeah. shortly. Yeah, it's like you, I'm sort of the natural born teacher. So yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, CJ, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I apologize for monopolizing so much of it towards. No, the end you've there, but... not. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. Storytelling is what connects us to others, yeah. right? That's yeah. what we really, we can really understand yeah. and make meaning and yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I was trying to connect it to your work and I hope I did that. I hope I was doing it correctly. Good, 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 good. So, but anyway, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and I am very grateful for your time. Ditto. I'm thankful that, you know, you invited me on here because I'm, I'm enjoying this too. Okay. Wonderful. Good. Well, until we speak again. (laughs) Thank you, Nick. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. You too. And that's a wrap on episode 84 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, and please support my work, uh, please consider becoming a patron. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you prefer to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be incredibly grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, even coworkers, anyone that you think will enjoy it. And please share it on social media too. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help me spread the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please make sure you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, be sure that you smash that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to, or watching, Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.